Good afternoon. Welcome to Worship here at Redeemer Evangelical Church. We welcome you today as we come to the 10th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Uh, today in God's Word, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8. Um, it's an, Actually, this week and next week, we're going to be looking at Romans 8. Uh, they're, they're, it's one of the great chapters of the Bible. And it's, we're going to look at it and give us, it will give us the theme, Patience for the Trip. So on your bulletin, you can see uh, the outline of our message for today. Um, just a couple of things about our worship today. Of course, uh, we're, we're in the uh, uh, order of having all Mass. Uh, however, you realize as a pastor speaking the word, uh, they say that I can't take the mask off. And you probably have a hard time understanding me when I, have a, when I don't have a mask on. If I had a mask on, you probably really wonder, what is that guy saying? Um, but as far as, and as far as communion is concerned, um, remember that I'm the only one that sets up communion. I'm the only one that handles the elements. Um, when I do that, I'm, I'm making sure that I I'm, um, have washed everything. I wear a mask when I'm putting the, the elements together. And remember that how we do that is that uh, at that time, uh, they'll just be, uh, you'll be ushered up to six at a time and um, spread out the communion rail. I set it in the holes in front of you, um, and then I step back and then have you kneel down, and then you take uh, the elements as I speak, um, as I speak the words, as we try to um, still worship and, and receive that wonderful gift of Lord's Supper, but yet uh, uh, maintain that uh, um, importance of our health. Let us today, um, as we think about um, patience for the trip, we're going to begin using the common service for this weekend and uh, the first four verses of hymn 233. Let's rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ ever 
Father has been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the God who and earth adore from us and from the angel hosts be praise and glory evermore today let us confess our faith in our God using the words of the Nicene Creed we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Today as we uh, prepare our hearts for this message, we sing two verses of that hymn, I Walk in Danger All the Way. And as we, as we look at our message today obviously the the theme patience for the trip is going to remind us that we're on a journey in life uh, but we're not on it alone and so we think about that as we sing the first two verses Storms of all my soul dismay. I pass through trials all the way. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So for us, uh, for us as parents, you might remember times when you had your children in the car and you were on a trip. And maybe you barely got out of Tomahawk 
how long is this shrimp gonna be? I was privileged to have my two of my grandchildren um, with me for three days this past week, and I kind of had forgotten just how short that attention span is. How long is this going to be? Are we there yet, right? And what, is, what does a parent often say? Sit down and be patient. As if that's going to all of a sudden just make our children go, oh, okay, I'll sit here and be quiet, right? But we pick on kids about that, but do we sometimes act like that as adults? More than once, and probably those words have come out of my mouth, where I have said, I'm ready to be done with this, right? I'm ready to be done. How long is this going to take? And we, we tend to lose a little bit of our patience. But Romans 8 comes to us at a great time to remind us that as we are on this journey, God has some amazing words of encouragement and reminder for us and lessons for us. We're going to have actually four truths that we're going to receive out of these very, very familiar words from Romans chapter 8. But let's set up these, set up these words for a moment. Romans 8, of course, comes right after Romans 7. And in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul had talked about the battle, right? Remember, he said, the good that I would that I don't do, but the evil that I don't do that I keep on doing. There's that battle that he had in life, right? But then at the end of chapter 7, he says what? He says, but thanks be to God, we have the victory through Christ. And then at the beginning of Romans 8, he talks about this wonderful indwelling of the Spirit, that we live by the Spirit, that the Spirit lives inside of us. And as he lives inside of us, he continues to help us, to give us, to give us strength, to give us encouragement. Even when it seems like the world has fallen apart, he says, but we have this strength. We have this, we have this spirit inside of us. And then at the end of that, coming to the end of the chapter, he says this in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Because those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now we're just going to kind of walk through these verses for a moment and, and look at verse 28. And look at the first two words. We know. The Apostle Paul says, we know. What a contrast to the world today. The world today does not tell us, what do you know? But the world today says, what do you feel? If you want truth, oh, just look into your heart. What do you feel in your heart? What horrible advice. Because all of our hearts are stained by sin. And they would always go in the wrong direction. And they have gone in the wrong direction. So we cannot live our life on feelings. And God doesn't want us to live our life on feelings. He has a, we're going through this journey of life, and he has not said to us, live on your feelings. Live on knowledge. Many of us in our cars may have a GPS system. Now, a, a child maybe doesn't quite get that. And so they're going on their feelings. They're like, oh, man, is this trip done yet? But as adults, we can look at this GPS system and we can go, oh, okay, well, I have 28 more miles to go. And our knowledge helps us understand, okay, this is, where, this is the trip that we're on. God has given us knowledge. Knowledge from his word. Not to live on our feelings, 
but to live on, this is what God tells us. The Holy Spirit works through the Word, and He tells us some very specific things, which we're going to hear about in just a moment. But your first Redeemer truth is this. Patience for the trip comes from knowing, not feeling. From knowing, not feeling. Because you and I have all, even as adults, we've been on trips. And even though we know how long a trip is, yet we, we still, doesn't, sometimes it feels like it's a long time. When I used to be travel a lot, when I used to be on our mission board where I did a lot of traveling, it would seem that the longest part of the trip was from Merrill to Tomahawk. How long is this going to last? Well, it lasts as long as it does every other time. 20 miles, there we are. But even though I know something, my feelings can betray it a little bit. So we always have to go to our knowledge. What does God say? And what does God say about our struggles? Notice he says this. We know that in all things God works for the good of the God works together. And, and notice that little thought of God works it together. Even when it doesn't feel like it. I know God is working something out, and he's working it together. And notice the Apostle Paul, as he writes this, he doesn't say, in all good things God works together, but he says, in all things, all things are working together. What we might consider good and what we might consider bad, it's all working together. Many of you have heard this already, this illustration, but I, I still like to keep using it. It always reminds me of, uh, uh, it's a good illustration that reminds me, I hope it's helpful for you. Some of you ladies, and maybe even some of you men, have done cross-stitch, right? And needlepoint, and, um, and when you do that, man, it makes a beautiful picture. In, in our meeting room, my grandmother, there's a picture, now it's gotten old and faded, but it's still under glass, and I look at it and I think of my grandma because she did that, and it's a picture of the Lord's Supper. But, you ladies know, what happens if you turn the picture over? Does it look good? No, it kind of looks like that, right? There's these knots, there's these broken ends. See, that's the problem. We are looking at life from the backside. And we're, we're going through what, we call, what I often call our knot days. These days of the knots and these days of the broken ends. And we wonder, really? God, what, what's going on here? Because we're not always seeing the front side. Now, there are times that we get to see the front side. We, there are times that we get to see, oh, now I know what God did there. But there's a lot of times we don't get to see it. And we don't feel it. But yet, in our minds and in our hearts, through the Holy Spirit, we know. We know that God is taking everything that's happening in life and using it according to His purpose. That's a key part of this. That it's not according to my purpose. See, and that's another problem we have. When ch children, what? Children are always about themselves, right? So the 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 drive in the car. It's about how they feel. It's about themselves. They could care less how the parents feel. It's about me. But the parent knows best. Oftentimes we're like the kids. And we're driving in the back seat of this car of life. God's driving. But we're going... I don't get it. Why are you going this way, Dad? Because he knows the best way. Because it's according to his purpose, which is always the best purpose for us. Oh, that's so important to remember. That God is working out a plan. And if we don't see it, that's not our God's fault. That's our fault. We're just like children to God then. And that's what we trust. And we know his promise. And we understand what he says in Ephesians 5. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything 
in conformity with the purpose of his will. He knows it says he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And I don't care if it's COVID or if it's uh, whenever you might have lost a job in your life or you've gone through a sickness in your life. God's going to take all of those things and meld it and, and work it together according to his will and purpose. And why always for your benefit and for my benefit? Your Redeemer truth number two is this. Patience for the trip comes from knowing, not feeling, knowing, not feeling that I'm included in his gracious plan. Are we there yet? You might be asking, are we done with that sermon yet? God has some beautiful thoughts for us today. And in the not days of life, in those broken end days of life, he gives us a promise. He says this, because those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Now here we have this, this amazing teaching in the scripture, the teaching of election and predestination. And there's a lot of confusion about that. God says he foreknew. Before the creation of the world, God knew you. And he chose you. Why does God tell us that? And how does that work? Brothers and sisters, it doesn't work this way. It does not work this way. That is, God looked into the future, saw that we would believe, and then chose us. No, because if that, if that were the case, that would mean that there's some part of our work in, our, in salvation. There is no work. We, we do not do any work for our salvation. God did it all. The point is, God chose you and then brought you to faith and then called you. Why? Why did he choose you? Evan, why did he choose you? Kurt, why did he choose you? Bonnie, why did he choose you? Karen, why did he choose you? Lori, why did he choose you? I don't know. Except he wanted to. He just simply wanted to. In other words, God didn't choose you because there was something intrinsically good in you or something about you. And what a blessing that is. If, if I think, okay, God chose me because, hey, you know, he, maybe he's not too bad of a pastor. What about on the days that I'm not a good pastor? Does that mean all of a sudden I'm not sure if I'm chosen? It's kind of like a dad and a mom loving their child. When do you love your children the most? Is it on the good days? Not necessarily. It's easy to love your children when, when they're behaving, right? But when your children are misbehaving and you love them. Why? Because that's what your heart wants to do. And God loves us and chose us because he wanted to do that. And that's an amazing comfort. God, God did not give us the doctrine of election. That is that he, he, called, he, he, he predestined us before the creation of the world to be believers. He didn't give it to us to boggle our minds because it could. He gave it to you for your comfort. And he doesn't give it to you so that you can be comfortable in sinning. No. He gives it to us so that we can be comfortable in the struggles of life and the trials of life and in the journey. And to know that no matter what this journey has for us, I'm chosen. I'm with God. He predestined us. And notice he said he predestined us to be like the firstborn. The image of, and that's Jesus. That's the plan of salvation. That your, son, your father in heaven sent his son Jesus to this earth. 
to suffer and to die. And notice that it says to be the firstborn of the dead. That is, that he was the first to rise. And every resurrection stems from him. And so your second redeemer, third redeemer truth is this. Patience for the trip comes from knowing that I'm chosen by God. That I'm chosen by God. I'm chosen by him. To be included in his plan and his gracious plan. And now Paul puts a bunch of phrases back to back. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Notice what he says. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, every one of those words, predestined, called, justified, and glorified, every one of those words could be a sermon in and of itself. Don't worry, we're not going to spend that much time on it. But let's just briefly look at these words. He predestined us. That is, as I just said, he, 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 he looked into the future, and he knew he would make you, and he knew that he would choose you to be his child. And because of that, then he called you. Why wasn't I born to Muslim families, to a Muslim family in Afghanistan or Iraq? It's not an accident. I was born to two people in Appleton, Wisconsin. And those two people, my mom and dad, took me down the aisle of Bethany Evangelical Lutheran Church and had me baptized. And yes, you know, there was that human decision. They made that decision, but it was God working behind it to say, this guy. I'm calling him to be a believer. And the same thing for each and every one of you. He's, he called you. He picked you out. And when he called you, then he justified you. Oh, man, what an amazing word, that word justify. You might remember the picture behind the word justify, the picture of a courtroom scene, right? And, and there's the judge sitting on the bench. And there's a defendant. The defendant has been charged with a crime. God the Father sitting on the bench. We're standing before him. And we've been accused and we've, uh, of, of the crime of sin. And we've done it, haven't we? But before, before God can say you're guilty, which we are, Jesus steps in the middle and says, wait a second. And he puts his white robe that he has on, he put it around you and me. He says, look, they're holy because they're covered in my holiness. And then he laid down his cross to the Father. He says, hey, and I, I paid for every single sin. And so God the Father slams down the gavel and says, you're not guilty. You won't have to pay the punishment for your sins. Wow. Pretty amazing, right? But that's not the end of it. Because then he says, us who have been justified, we are then glorified. Whenever you're on a trip, most of the time, you're looking forward to the destination, right? Now, there are some trips that we take, and, on, and there's a lot of things along the way. But in a trip, we're thinking, I want to get from here to there, and that's where, I'm, uh, that's where I'm having my fun. I'm driving from here to Florida to Disney World, <clears throat> and that's where I'm going to have my fun. God is reminding us that while we're on this journey of life, there is a destination, and that destination is heaven. And we're going to be glorified. That is, we're going to be just like Jesus. In Philippians 2, he says, we'll have a body, a glorified body, just like Jesus' glorified body. Purged from all sin. All the sorrows, what does he say? There'll be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more crying, no more mourning, no more tears. 
sometimes the journey is difficult. But he says, look past it. Look to the end. And when you get there, God, it'll be more than fun. It'll be awesome. We'll be glorified. Your fourth Redeemer truth is patience for the trip comes from knowing that I was chosen by God to be included in his grace plan and that I will be glorified with Jesus. Are we there yet? God hasn't given us the, the final day of our number, the, the number of our days, has he? I don't know how long our journey is going to be. I don't know how long your journey is going to be. We had a funeral this afternoon or this morning of a man who was 58. Other people in town have died recently. They've been over 80. We don't know the days that God has numbered for us on our journey. And that's okay. We don't need to know that. All that we need to know is that we're wa not walking this journey alone. All that we need to know is that we walk this journey with Jesus. And with him by our side, we know that everything that happens on our journey of life, everything that happens, God is working it all out to this magnificent picture. And someday you and I in the halls of heaven are going to look back. And we're going to see this beautiful picture that God made of our lives. Even including those not days, those broken end days. When we keep that focus in our minds, that gives us patience. Patience for the journey. And that's what God gives you in Romans 8. I walk with Jesus all the way. Verses 5 and 6, we sing. I walk with Jesus all the way His guidance never fails me He takes my every fear away when Satan's power assails me and by his footsteps led, my path I safely tread. In spite of ills that threaten me, I walk with Jesus all the way. My walk is heavenward all the way, awaits my soul the morrow. When you farewell can gladly say to all your sin and sorrow, all worldly pomp be gone, to heaven I now press on. For all the world I would not stay. I walk his heavenward all the way. Father in heaven, we are on a journey. You have told us this. Sometimes our feelings betray us. Help us, Lord God, not to live on our feelings, but to live on a sure and certain knowledge that you walk with us and that you lead us all the way and will lead us all the way to our home in heaven. Father, it is especially during the difficult days of life that our eyes can lose a little focus. Help us always to remain focused on you and the promise that all things are working out to, for good to those who love God. Father, we pray that this focus will continue to be with Dean Tesh, Joe Carl, and Bob Westcott as they face their battle against cancer. Remind them, Lord God, that they walk this danger not alone, but you hold them up each and every day. Continue to let your presence encourage Chris Callahan that with all the difficulties he's facing, yet you remind him that you are building a beautiful picture for his life. Thank you for continuing to be with Thule Goldbeck as she recovers from her surgery. Give her strength and health more and more each and every day. 
and be with our dear brother Dick Leipsky as he also recovers from his hospital stay and his recent fall. Give him healing and strength to his heart. Father in heaven, we pray for the family of Joe Ugolini, who left this world so suddenly last Saturday. We pray, Lord God, for his wife Lori and his two daughters and all the family members that are left behind. Remind them to look to you and find their peace, their comfort, and their consolation in you. Father in heaven, today we come before you as a family of believers, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, 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 ye the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is a new cup of my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. During the time of the distribution, we're going to listen to several songs that are going to remind us of the blessing that is ours of Holy Communion. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in the true faith unto life everlasting. Part in peace. Amen.
take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Strengthen. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Given into death for your sins. Take drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith. Until life everlasting. Part in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Part in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. You part in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. You part in peace. Amen.
Let's rise for prayer. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We close our worship with this last hymn, um, which we're going to listen to the first three verses of it. We've been reminded today once again that our life is a journey. That means every day is a journey. Morning, noon, afternoon, and evening. And this verse reminds, this hymn reminds us that throughout each part of the day, our God is with us. We'll join in singing the fourth verse, reminding us that whenever we go to bed, God is with us. We pray that God has encouraged your hearts today uh, and, and that throughout this coming week as you either receive the devotions via email or you pick them up from me at the door, um, that uh, you'll take this word of God beyond uh, today and think about it throughout the week. And uh, we have a journey before us this coming week and we all need patience, don't we? I know I have all the patience I ever need. I think oftentimes my prayer has been, Lord, give me patience, and I want it now. Um, but uh, we, all, we all need this as we walk. And, and that, it's not just this time, but it's any time um, in our lives. Remember, the offering plates are by the back door, or, or you can put them in the drop box by the door as well. Keep your bulletin. We can't reuse them, so just take them with you so that they're not around here for tomorrow. And um, reminder, the church meetings are on Tuesday. Um, in, you sh should have received a congregational letter this past week. I hope you did. If you didn't, let me know. Um, it was either mailed to those who don't have email or it was emailed to you. Um, the second page had some items about our First Steps edition, so our, our Learning Center edition. So just to kind of recap about that, 
Um, we have received approval to start digging, if we could. Uh, so we've received that permit to, to start the digging. We can't yet start because of a couple of things. One is financial. Um, we just, um, the appraisal should have been done Friday. They told us it would be done Friday, so we'll find out tomorrow. Uh, if the banks, uh, or Tuesday, the, very soon the banks will get it. Then the banks will be determining whether or not we can get the loan that we are asking for. Um, but we're pretty confident that that's all going to happen. Um, financially, we have reached um, over the 95,000 mark. Um, and uh, so we're, we're striving towards 100. Um, our goal would be by the end of the project to have 140,000 um, of, of offerings gathered that. And uh, that would, be, of course, offset all of any type of uh, um, expense. And as we think about that, you know, the, the project, this, this project, all of the, the, the total costs that we receive from the contractors, the bill, you know, the, the, the contract about, you know, how much this is going to cost covers everything, almost everything. Um, that, that if the contractors, the plumbers, you know, the excavators, if they would do all the work. So that means that anything that we do volunteer-wise takes money off of that. Um, and I, and I, some of you guys who maybe are a little more savvy on building might disagree with me. But, you know, you think about an average contractor worker, 50 bucks an hour they get, all right? Some get a lot more than that. Now, I know that I'm not worth 50 bucks an hour. My work is probably not worth 50. That is, the, I'm hoping this work is worth that. But I'm talking about the work of if I was out there pounding nails or whatever, because it's going to take me a lot longer. Um, but I say, okay, I bet you I could, I could work well enough for $20 an hour. So if I work 100 hours, how much is that? Is that 2000 2000 $2,000 could be taken off the price if I worked 100 hours. Um, so that's what I want you to think about. Now, obviously not everybody's able to do volunteer work because there's all kinds of things that we're going to be, um, pretty soon there's going to be lists out and things that we can do, but there's, there's simple things like clean up, there's going to be painting, there's going to be staining. Anything that we do takes money off of the price of, of this project. Um, and I think that's a pretty cool thing to see. Uh, we as God's people can work together on that. So just to keep that in mind as things start moving forward, um, we're, we're getting really excited here about um, hopefully pretty quick, everything's going to come together and you're going to start seeing some fencing going up and you're going to start seeing some holes in the ground um, and trucks rolling in and, and we're pretty excited about it. So uh, keep that in your prayers as well as uh, uh, keep, we'll be sending out continual updates about um, how that's all going to go. With that, we wish you the Lord's blessings. And um, hey, COVID can't stop us from saying hi to each other. Say hi to each other. Have a great day. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare to make no On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand
from the funeral today.